Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today's program, you will hear stories from John Russell and Jill Robbins. Dan Novak has this week's education report. He then joins me in studio to talk more about the topic. Finally, John Russell returns to present today's lesson of the day. But first... What do Lady Gaga, Barack Obama, and Bill Gates have in common, aside from their fame? They are all left-handed. But why are 10% of people left-handed, while most are right-handed? Researchers are trying to find out. A recent study identified a genetic cause of left-handedness in some people. Researchers found rare variants of a gene involved in controlling the shape of cells. They found the variants to be 2.7 times more common in left-handed people. These genetic variants account for possibly 0.1% of left-handedness. But the researchers said a gene, called TUBB4B, might play a part in the development of brain asymmetry. In most people, the two halves, or hemispheres, of the brain have slightly different structures and are dominant for different activities. For example, most people have left hemisphere dominance for language and right hemisphere dominance for tasks that require directing visual attention to a location in space, said Clyde Franks of the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in the Netherlands. Franks was the top writer of the study published recently in Nature Communications. Franks suggested that for most people, the left side of the brain controls the dominant right hand. The nerve fibers cross from left to right in the lower part of the brain, Franks said. He added, In left-handers, the right hemisphere is in control of the dominant hand. The question is, what causes the asymmetry of the brain to develop differently in left-handers? TUBB4B controls a protein that gets formed into filaments called microtubules. These microtubules give structure to the insides of cells. The changes in TUBB4B that are more common in left-handers suggest that microtubules are involved in setting up the brain's normal asymmetries, Franks said. The two brain hemispheres start to develop differently in the human embryo. Scientists do not know the mechanism that controls this. Rare genetic variants in just a handful of people can pinpoint genes that give clues to developmental mechanisms of brain asymmetry in everyone, Franks added. TUBB4B is an example. The study's findings were based on genetic data from more than 350,000 middle-aged to older adults in Britain. It was from the UK Biobank. About 11% of the people involved were left-handed. For most people, left- or right-handedness might come down to chance. Changes in the levels of some molecules during important times of brain development could influence it, Franks suggested. Historically, many cultures disapproved of left-handedness and forced people to become right-handed. In English, the word right 
also means correct or proper. And the expression a left-handed compliment means that a comment might seem nice but is an insult. The levels of left-handedness differ around the world, with lower rates in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East compared to Europe and North America, Franks said. This likely reflects suppression of left-handedness in some cultures, making left-handed kids switch to right-handedness, which also used to happen in Europe and North America, Franks added. The new findings might have use in the field of mental health. People with schizophrenia are around twice as likely to be left-handed or ambidextrous. People with autism are around three times as likely, Frank said. He observed that genes involved in developing the brain in early life might be involved in brain asymmetry and mental health. Our study found suggestive evidence of this, and we have also seen it in previous studies where we looked at more common genetic variants in the population, Franks added. I'm John Russell. Next, Jill Robbins reads another winning entry from our Teach Us About Ukraine writing contest. I am Natalia Vasilchenko, and I teach English at Lyceum 17 of Milnitsky. In the land of unexpected feelings, Sinitsa, a rural settlement, stands as an endless testament to my heart's faithfulness. This charming village, nestled within the Lviv region, circled by the lofty peaks of mountainous valleys, awakes a great sensation of joy and happiness each time my footsteps lead me to reunite with cherished friends. As one embarks on the serpentine ascent and descent through the mountainous pass, the very sight of this idyllic sanctuary leaves one breathless. It is a sight to contemplate. The wooden cottages perched upon emerald hillocks, the gilded domes of churches, shimmering beneath the sunbeams, and the winding pathways weaving into dense ancient forests. It is a place often called the Ukrainian Switzerland, a spa resort named after Omelon Stotsky. Here, the atmosphere is as pristine as crystal, the mineral springs endowed with healing properties, and the residents ever welcoming, drawing visitors from around the world. More than a century ago, this village was one of Europe's foremost bastions of oil production. In the 19th century, this territory, once a dominion of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, yielded the riches of oil and ozokarit, a natural wax. Entrepreneurs from Germany, Great Britain, Belgium, France, and the United States undertook the industrialization of these oil fields. Over time, oil production was reduced, and the wealthy village transformed into an ordinary mountain town until a local retiree researched the healing properties of numerous springs. Presently, Sinitsa boasts a cache of 38 mineral springs, their presence complemented by the embrace of the lush surrounding forests and mountain meadows. This destination offers escape to those looking for liberation from noisy urban life, providing recovery from the daily routine. Whether one seeks healing in the therapeutic air or relaxation in the mineral waters, the region caters to the most demanding traveler. Sinitsa shares its borders with the Skolitsi Beskidi National Park, a territory of recreation and natural beauty enjoyed by all who venture here. Among the modern facilities of spa hotels, 
and private cottages, guests can meander through the woods, forage for wild berries or mushrooms, or simply bask in the serenity and splendor of nature. For those unafraid of a dive into the freezing cold water, the Sinichanka River offers a small but forceful waterfall that promises an exhilarating rush of adrenaline. To behold the majesty of these landscapes from a high point, one must climb Siuhu Mount and take in the wide view from the observation tower. In moments of missing the city life, visitors can go into the village center. Among its crooked stone streets, one discovers traditional cafes and modern restaurants with stylish interiors offering delicious culinary delights. Coffee lovers can enjoy a cup or more in cozy coffee houses, while the charming Alf shop offers local pastries, sweets, and baked goods. A stroll along the main street reveals an array of unusual shops, including a local pottery workshop where one can craft or purchase clay masterpieces. A souvenir shop displaying intricate glass mosaics invites exploration. At a short distance from Sinitsa, tourists can discover the remnants of the Tustang Fortress on the rocks, which once controlled the transportation of salt to Europe. An historical museum showcases a captivating array of artifacts and a holographic image of the ancient fortress. It gives visitors an opportunity to try on knightly armor and hold a heavy iron sword. For family entertainment, there is a nearby water park, one of the largest in Ukraine. On summer evenings, as per tradition, an open-air theater hosts concerts and performances. After the performance, the audience can return home surrounded by the flashing lights of fireflies dancing in the evening breeze. One cannot simply number all the attractions of this exquisite town. The natural splendor of the Carpathians, the enhanced infrastructure, specialized medical facilities, and modern spa retreats, alongside rustic cottages, are all filled with an irresistible magnetism. All who enter this magical pearl of Ukraine will fall in love with its charms, returning time and again, wrapped up in a lifelong affair. I'm Jill Robbins. During the COVID-19 pandemic, public officials brought renewed attention to indoor air quality in schools. Improving ventilation and airflow was considered a way to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and other diseases. In January, the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, said indoor pollution can be two to five times higher than outdoor levels. The agency said children face higher risk from indoor pollutants like asbestos, mold, radon, and methane. They also face pollution from particulate matter like vehicle exhaust or wildfire smoke, which can enter classrooms from the outside. The EPA said climate change has made safe indoor air quality more important. Pollutants can lead to a number of health problems for children if they breathe them for a long period, the EPA said. Health effects might include coughing, breathing diseases, allergic reactions, asthma, and cancer. The agency said there are several ways to maintain healthy indoor air quality. These include controlling pollutants, ventilating outdoor air, and maintaining temperature and water in the air, or its humidity. 
a 2022 international study published in the Journal of Building Engineering said thousands of American schools have outdated HVAC systems. HVAC stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. A 2020 study from the U.S. Government Accountability Office said that 9% of school districts needed to fix environmental conditions like mold, lead, or asbestos in at least half their schools. Indoor air quality might affect school performance. Some studies say that a healthy school environment lifts attendance, increases test scores, and improves learning. A study of 10,000 school districts from the National Bureau of Economic Research found that decreased pollution in schools led to higher test scores. Many schools have not taken steps to improve ventilation, although research suggests it is important. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, had recommended four ways to improve ventilation in schools. They included simple changes like opening windows and using fans to maintain airflow in buildings. Costly recommendations included replacing HVAC systems using in-room air cleaners or installing ultraviolet germicidal irradiation or UVGI devices. Scientists and public health leaders pushed school districts to use federal pandemic emergency money for ventilation systems. But a 2022 CDC study of over 8,000 school districts found that about half had taken any of the four recommendations. That few districts had taken steps to improve air quality shows the ongoing opportunity to improve air quality among K-12 school buildings in the United States, the authors of the study wrote. The aid money expires this fall. In January, the EPA announced $32 million in grant funding to reduce air pollution and greenhouse gases at schools in poor communities. Nonprofit organizations and state governments could apply for the grants which are expected to be awarded this fall. The EPA said the program was part of a set of policies from President Joe Biden's administration. The money came from the Inflation Reduction Act passed by Congress in 2022. In the announcement, EPA Deputy Administrator Janet McCabe said EPA is working with our partners to improve air quality and energy efficiency. I'm Dan Novak. Dan Novak is here now to talk more about today's education report. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for having me, Ashley. Your story today was about air quality in American school buildings. Why did you choose to write about this issue? With COVID, there was a lot of attention on improving air circulation in schools to prevent disease spread. And this is, of course, an important reason to improve school air quality. But I think that global warming is a much larger factor when it comes to providing good air quality in schools. When it's hotter out, it's easier for smog and haze to form. And we saw last year with the wildfires in Canada just how bad the air can be thousands of miles away. This affects both the health of children and their learning. So we don't always think about how these environmental problems affect the quality of education. You note in the story that good indoor air quality improves test scores. Yes, it's been well documented that good air quality leads to better school outcomes, and attendance is better as well. I did not know before writing this that indoor air quality, if not properly ventilated, can be much worse than outdoor air quality. 
That only makes getting proper air ventilation into schools that much more important. But many American schools have outdated or old HVAC systems, right? Yes, tens of thousands of schools have heating, cooling, and ventilation systems that need to be replaced. But it does not appear that districts have been using pandemic relief money on those kinds of improvements, and that's one reason why the Biden administration has made available $32 million in grant funding for poor school districts, specifically to improve air quality. All right, an interesting topic for sure. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Dan. You're welcome. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. In this next report, Jill Robbins tells us about a study that explores where early humans went after leaving Africa. We learn that early humans likely stayed in the Middle East for thousands of years before going elsewhere. Pay careful attention to the word dispersed. We will talk more about it after the report. A new study offers an answer to the question of where early humans traveled after leaving Africa. Scientists say modern humans, or Homo sapiens, developed in Africa more than 300,000 years ago. Early humans then left Africa between 60,000 to 70,000 years ago. Researchers said in a recently released study that these groups of hunter-gatherers appear to have stayed for thousands of years in an area of the Middle East. That area includes modern-day Iran, southeastern Iraq, and northeastern Saudi Arabia. The early humans went on to settle all of Asia and Europe starting about 45,000 years ago. The scientists based their findings on genomic data taken from ancient DNA and from the genes of modern people. Scientists combined that data with paleoecological evidence. That is ancient evidence that suggests what the environment in these areas would have been like long ago. The evidence suggested the area in the Middle East would have been good for early humans. The researchers called this area a hub for these early people before they continued to more distant places. At the time, they numbered perhaps only in the thousands. The study was published in the scientific journal Nature Communications. Michael Petraglia is an anthropologist and a study co-author. He said, the study is a story about us and our history. Our goal was to unravel some of the mystery about our evolution and our worldwide dispersal. The combination of genetic and paleoecological models allowed us to predict the location where early human populations first lived as soon as they left Africa, Petraglia added. These people lived in small groups of hunter-gatherers, the researchers said. The hub location offered several environmental settings, from forest to grasslands, changing over time between dry and wet periods. There would have been many resources available, with evidence showing the hunting of wild gazelle, sheep, and goat, Petraglia said. They would have eaten plants and small to large-sized game. Hunter-gatherer groups seem to have practiced a seasonal lifestyle. Living in the lowlands in the cooler months and in the mountainous regions in the warmer months, Petroglia said. The people living in the hub at the time had dark skin and dark hair. 
many might have looked like the Gumus or Anuak people now living in parts of East Africa, said Luca Pagani, one of the study's writers. Later, they dispersed in different directions beyond the hub, and the genetic differences developed between present-day East Asians and Europeans, the researchers said. The study used modern and ancient genomic data for European and Asian people. The researchers found a way to disentangle the extensive genetic mixing of populations that has taken place since then. There were earlier smaller dispersals of Homo sapiens out of Africa before the most important migration 60,000 to 70,000 years ago. But the study said these appear to have been dead ends, meaning they produced nothing. Homo sapiens was not the first human species to live outside of Africa, including the area surrounding the hub. Ancient intermixing by modern humans has left small traces of Neanderthal in the DNA of modern non-Africans. The lead writer of the study, Leonardo Vellini, said there is evidence Neanderthals lived in the area before the arrival of Homo sapiens, so the hub may well have been where that interaction took place. Homo sapiens is the scientific name for today's humans. It means wise man. I'm Jill Robbins. Before the report, we asked you to pay careful attention to the word dispersed. Can you remember when you heard it? You heard the term used to describe the movements of people in the past. Let's listen again. Later, they dispersed in different directions beyond the hub, and the genetic differences developed between present-day East Asians and Europeans, the researchers said. Dispersed is the past form of the verb disperse. We spell disperse like this. D-I-S-P-E-R-S-E Disperse means to spread apart or to move in different directions. Our example gives us a clue to the meaning. You heard, later, they dispersed in different directions beyond the hub. We can use disperse to talk about many issues. For example, in the news you might hear about protests. You might hear that police forced the protesters to disperse, or the military ordered the protesters to disperse. In these cases, the police or the military is forcing or ordering people to go in different directions, away from each other. We might use disperse to talk about the weather, as in the clouds slowly dispersed. In this case, disperse means that the clouds are breaking apart or disappearing. Regardless of the situation, you should try to connect the verb disperse with the idea of movement. Disperse means that people or objects are moving somewhere else. And that's the lesson of the day. I'm John Russell. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 